Welcome to an online Bible study from Harbor Sight Baptist Church, a place of safety, rest, and resupply. We now join Pastor Arbuckle for this week's Bible study. We're going to finish up looking at what others believe this evening, and um, I want to I will look at another group real quickly, so, uh, a group that you're probably familiar with. You may not be familiar with their what some folks call them, um, but we're going to look at the Campbellites this evening. The Campbellites, okay? If you want to um, turn in your Bibles to, we're going to start, um, well, find Acts chapter 2. We'll get there here in just a little bit, but let's have a word of prayer as we get started. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the opportunity that we have once again to come together. We thank you for these that have come out. We ask your blessings upon every family that is represented. And Lord, as we've been looking at what others believe, it is again not um, my desire, certainly not uh, the desire that we would have just to have an academic exercise um, and certainly not uh, our desire to get in an argument with those that may believe what these other groups believe may be part of these other groups, other the, these other churches and religions and so forth. It is our desire, my desire, to just simply present what God, the, the gospel has to say, what your word has to say. We know that your word is truth, and we need to make sure that we are aware uh, not only what other information is out there, um, but what your word has to say as far as countering that uh, false information. And we pray that you would give us that understanding. Give us compassion, Lord, uh, for those that may be involved in these other groups, uh, these other religions, because Jesus died for them as well. And we know from your word that if they die without trusting Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, that they will not be in heaven when we get there. And we would pray that you would help us just to uh, pray for them, that you would help us to be good stewards of your word, that you would also work in the hearts and lives of these dear folks. And, and undoubtedly, we, we probably have uh, people in our list of acquaintances, maybe even family, Lord, uh, that are uh, involved in these uh, various religions and various groups and so on. And we would pray that you would help us to be good testimonies and then pray for them and then also and, and most importantly point them to Christ before it's eternally too late. We ask your blessings on our time and we pray Lord that you would just work in every circumstance that we'll bring before your throne during our prayer time. We thank you in advance in Jesus name. Amen. Now I mentioned uh, this group that uh, we're going to call Campbellites or you might know them as uh, Disciples of Christ. You might know them as um, the Christian church. You might know them as, and, and probably here in our area, uh, as the, the Church of Christ. And uh, I, I was not aware uh, of the Church of Christ when I was in school. It wasn't until we moved to Ohio uh, that we came in contact with um, some folks. As a matter of fact, we had a neighbor that was... Um, um, for years, one of the church, he went to the Church of Christ and so forth, and we came in contact with a lot of them. But um, the founder, we'll start with that. Um, now, this was this particular group. Their beliefs were developed through the teachings and leadership of two men, Thomas Campbell and his son Alexander, Alexander Campbell uh, and Thomas Campbell. They first organized a group of, if you want to call it like-minded individuals, in 1811, but it was not until 1827 that a young man by the name of Walter Scott, who was the youngest of the founding fathers of the Disciples of Christ, began to practice and teach salvation through baptism, okay? Or what do, we, what do we call it? What is, if, if you have to be baptized to be saved, what do we call that? What is it? 
It's baptismal regeneration, okay? Uh, that's what it is. And um, they teach, however, that Christ started their church in A.D. 33, okay? Uh, they will tell you that. They will tell you Christ founded the church. Uh, why is it important? It's important because there are approximately 2 million worldwide that claim to be or, or are part of the Church of Christ, and that is, and they're involved in that. That um, two million are in approximately forty-one thousand five hundred churches. Those different congregations here in the United States, there's about one point one million in the United States, and and that's comprised of um, about twelve thousand congregations. So there are roughly 12,000 churches of Christ or uh, different kinds, uh, and I mentioned the uh, Christian church, and sometimes you'll, um, you'll drive through town and you'll see Christian church and then in parentheses underneath it, disciples of Christ. How many have ever seen a sign, a church sign like that? Um, there are also just Christian churches and so forth. And um, some of their beliefs, um, they do not worship with instrumental music. There are no instruments, no background music, or anything like that. When they sing, they sing a cappella, okay? Now, hold your finger in Acts chapter 2 because I want you to uh, look at the verse, a couple verses of Scripture that they use uh, to, to claim that, again, this is a biblical way of worshiping. Uh, when you come across Ephesians, hold your finger in Ephesians chapter 5. We'll look at a verse of scripture there, but look at Colossians 3 and verse... Yes, uh, Acts chapter 2, we want to get there. Uh, but Colossians chapter 3 and verse number 16. So which one uh, We're going to start with Colossians. We'll work our way backward. Colossians 3 and verse 16 says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Turn back toward Ephesians chapter 5 and look at verse 19. Ephesians 5.19 says, Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Now they use those two verses to say that any worship in specifically the church of Christ has to be without music. Now I'm not sure... When you look at those verses, how they get there, but those are the verses they use. They specifically say in, you know, making melody in your heart and so forth. They, um, so they use those verses. Uh, another belief that they have is that the Lord's Supper should be taken every Sunday. Anytime you go to a Church of Christ or one of those variants that we've mentioned, you're going to have the opportunity to take communion or the Lord's Supper, okay? Even though 1 Corinthians 11, I'll not have you turn there, verse 26, Paul says, as often as ye do it. How often is that? As often as you do it, okay? I've come, across, come in contact with um, Bible-believing, Bible-preaching churches uh, that have communion maybe twice a year. Maybe they'll only have it once a year. Um, I pastored a church that uh, it was traditional once a month. And, uh, you know, it could be one, once a quarter, whenever. If you want to do it every Sunday, that's fine. Uh, but to say, well, if you don't do it every Sunday, then you can't really be a Christian. You can't really be following the Bible. And so one is certainly a pretty big stretch. Uh, I'll not go into this point, but um, another, another one of their beliefs is that uh, your salvation can be lost. 
your salvation can be lost, okay? But what do we know from Scripture? There are a lot of passages of Scripture that talk about eternal and everlasting life. And what does that mean? It means exactly what it says. Every, you know, it's everlasting life. It's eternal. It will never go away. We cannot lose it. Uh, an interesting point surrounding that idea is that they believe in, and we'll look at this a little deeper here in just a second, but they, leave, they believe that in order to be saved, you have to be baptized, okay? Now, let's just suppose that I'm baptized in the Church of Christ by a Church of Christ preacher. According to them, I'm saved. But they also warn me that I can lose my salvation. They do not tell you what will get you lost again. Okay? And what they also believe, believe it or not, is that if you get lost after you've lost your salvation, you don't have to be rebaptized to get saved again. So that's pretty interesting to me. The first time, baptism is necessary. However, many other times you get resaved, you don't have to get rebaptized. So I, th I think that's pretty interesting. Now, you're patiently holding your fingers in Acts chapter 2. I won't say the most important belief that they have, but one that is not just common to them. There are other groups, other religions that believe that in order to get to heaven, they will, and they will tell you, yes, we believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We believe that he was the son of God. We believe that he died on the cross as payment for our sin. We believe that... Um, also believe that, you know, you put your faith in him for your salvation, but you have to be baptized in order to go to heaven. I can remember having a conversation. I may have mentioned this when we were talking about the Jehovah's Witnesses. I spoke to a couple that stood on our porch for probably two and a half hours. And I, fi I finally narrowed them down and nailed them down. I said, okay, so... <clears throat> If, if I believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, I believe that I'm a sinner. I can't save myself. God loved me, sent his son to die for me on the cross, and, and I believe that. Can I be saved? And one of, the couple, one, one of this couple, I think it was the lady, said, no. I said, why not? She said, because you have to be baptized. I said, so... My belief in what Christ did on the cross is not sufficient for my salvation. No. I said, so what's the important part of your gospel? She said, well, we believe that he died. She went down through the whole, all the points that we just discussed. And she said, in baptism, and then you have to join the church, and then you have to do good works. I said, so... Let's just suppose I do all of that except get baptized or on the way to get baptized. I get hit by a log truck as I'm going around an Amish buggy and I die. Before I get baptized, will I go to heaven? She said no. And I said, so what's the important part of it? Is it the baptism? And then it was like, oh, my goodness, we've been here for all this long time. We've got other places to go. But that is the emphasis of their, their salvation. Now, in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 2, you're familiar with the story, I'm sure. The day of Pentecost has come. Uh, Peter has, has preached. There have been thousands of souls saved and so forth. Uh, but let's look a little uh, into this. Notice, if you will, um, verse 37. Acts 2, 37 says, Now when they heard this, and this is what Peter's preaching, okay? Um, and I'll not go through the, all of the, that Peter preached and so forth. You can read that for yourselves. But it says, um, when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart, and they said unto Peter 
and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Okay? What shall we do? And Peter says unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now here's, here's one of their primary pivotal verses that they use to say baptism is necessary for salvation, okay? Because he says right there, repent and be baptized for the remission of sins, okay? That's what he said, all right? Now, you have to understand that this also hinges, in a matter of speaking, on the very small little bitty word that says, for the remission of sins. That is a preposition. In the original language of the Greek, it is the word ace. It's spelled E-I-S, okay? And it has a variety of meanings depending on the context. Now, just bear with me. I don't bump your brain into neutral. Don't let your eyes glaze over, okay? This is important for us to understand. Now, the Church of Christ claims that it means in order to or for the purpose of, okay? And as it refers to salvation. So if, if that is the meaning of it, here's what we, it, it, it could be translated. Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of of Jesus Christ for the purpose of the remission of sins or in order to have your sins remitted or removed, okay? But Peter, you have to understand this, you have to read the context, okay? Peter has already told them how to be saved. Look at verse 21 of Acts chapter 2. Notice what it says there. Acts 2.21 says, And it shall come to pass, now notice, that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord, what's the last part of verse 22, or 21, I'm sorry? Shall be saved. Shall be saved. He does not mention baptism there. Okay? And also, notice the question in verse 37 that these, these people that are there that are listening to Peter that have had their been pricked in their hearts and so forth, what did they ask? What's the question? What shall we do? What shall we do now, basically, is what they're talking about, okay? And Peter has already mentioned that. Um, he doesn't say, they don't say, what shall we do to be saved, okay? There is a gentleman in the book of Acts, if you want to turn to Acts 16, hold your finger in Acts chapter 2, we'll get there, go back there. Acts 16, notice if you will, this is the conversion of the Philippian jailer, Okay? Verse 30, after Paul and Silas were thrown in prison, what did they do? They groused and complained and fussed and decided they're not, you know, they're not being treated right. God hates them, and they're, they're going to go do something else. Is that what they decided? No. We know that they prayed and sang hymns and so forth, and at midnight we understand what happened. Uh, the the uh, change fell off, the doors of the prison were opened up and so forth, and the Philippian jailer comes in there, and he says in verse number 30 of Acts 16, after he brought them out of the prison, Sirs, what's the question? What must I do to be saved? Very specific, okay? 
Notice the answer in verse 31. What does he say? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. Okay? Where's baptism in Acts 16.31? It's not there for salvation. Now, please don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that baptism is not important. Okay? It is an act of obedience. We are, we are supposed to do that. Okay? But as far as our salvation is concerned, it, 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 it doesn't do anything for our salvation. Okay? Um, you know, take we, the, the classic example, if you want to call him that, is the thief on the cross. And we know from what Jesus said, today thou shalt be with me in paradise, in heaven. Okay? So the baptism is important as a testimony, uh, but it is not important as in salvation. Um, let me give you, let's go back to the Greek, okay? Um, look at, hold your finger in Acts 2, look at Luke chapter 5. There's another occurrence where this word is used that will help us understand how it's also used in the book of Acts, in chapter 2 and verse 38 of the book of Acts. Luke chapter 5, verse number 12, says, And it came to pass, when he was in a certain city, speaking of Jesus, behold, a man full of leprosy, who seeing Jesus fell on his face and besought him, saying, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. And Jesus put forth his hand and touched him, and sa him, saying, I will be thou clean. Now notice the last part of verse 13. And immediately the leprosy departed from him. Okay? He was cleansed. Now, here's where we get into the verse that talks about that little preposition, ace in the original language, four in the, in the English. It says, And he charged him to tell no man, but go and show thyself to the priest and offer ace, Thy cleansing according as Moses commanded for a testimony unto them. Okay, now answer this question. What was it that cleansed this man of his leprosy? Was it the, was it the offering that he gave or was it the Lord that did it? The Lord did it before he gave the offering. So what was the offering for? The offering was a testimony of the healing that he already had. Okay? That little word for right there, for thy cleansing. It could be, it's not in order for your cleansing. It's not for the purpose of your cleansing. It's because of your cleansing. Understand that? There's a big difference. I know it sounds like, semantic gymnastics as you as it were but it, it does make a make a difference how we understand that verse 38 of acts chapter 2 again you could translate this verse repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of jesus christ because of the remission of sins. That's, that would be a, a literal translation of it. And it's not in order to or for the purpose of. Okay, does that make sense? I hope so. I know it's kind of technical, but I, I hope, I hope it, 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 it's something that you understand because it's very, very important. It's easy for us to say when we read through it in the English language, well, it says repent and be baptized like it all goes together but the baptism is a testimony of the repentance that's taken place prior to the baptism let me give you an illustration when a person goes to jail 
we say they go to jail for a crime, right? For a crime. Now, what does that mean? Why are they going to jail for the crime? It's because of the crime that they're going to jail. They're not going to jail in order to commit a crime, are they? What about this? Here's another illustration. Maybe you know somebody that this happened to. A person gets a ticket for speeding. Can they take that ticket then and just run down the road as fast as they can and say, I got a ticket in order to speed. They gave this to me and I now have the ability in order to speed. It's right here. Is, is that what that's for? Is that what that means? No. It's because you committed a crime, just a little one, just a little sin, right, uh, of, of um, going over the posted speed limit, right? Okay, I'm guilty. I confess. Don't, Mrs. Arbuckle, don't say anything. Don't agree. <laughs> don't nod your head, okay? But we understand what that, when somebody says, um, I went to jail for a crime. I got a ticket for speeding. We understand what that means. It's, it, it means because of. And, and that's what this little preposition, this little bitty word for in Acts 2.38 means. We repent and we're baptized because of the remission of sins, we've already got it. And it is a testimony, and certainly it is an identification when we say, or when we get baptized, we are identifying with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It is a testimony that we have had that salvation experience. And if... The four in verse 38 of Acts chapter 2 had meant in order to or for the purpose of, okay, it would have been a completely different word because in the original Greek language, the word henna was available and is used to mean in order that. There's a specific word that would have given that meaning, but that is not the word that was used in the original language. So anytime somebody pulls up Acts 2.38, I know it sounds like it when you read it in the English language, but that's not what it means. It means because of. Because of the remission of sins, the fact that I have repented prior to that, and because I've had my sins washed away by the blood of Christ, I'm, I'm going to be baptized. That's, that's the idea there. Now, um, another, another interesting thing about the Church of Christ is this. And this started way back in the, in the early 19th century, okay? And it's probably just as true today as it was back then. One of the things that the Church of Christ and their preachers and their theologians like to do is debate. They like to argue. They like to debate. Whether it be, you know, there used to be many radio broadcasts way back when now it's on YouTube you can find it, probably pull it up uh, on social media and so forth but they like to debate they like to argue they like to try and and prove their point okay that's not our goal 
I don't have to prove God right. I mentioned to our, our men, and I might have mentioned it Sunday, um, but when God speaks, the argument is over, and God has spoken. Um, what do you do for him? Well, you pray for him. You pray for him. I had a, a neighbor when we lived up in Louisville called me, and they were looking for a pastor at his Church of Christ. And he said, I'm on the, do you know what a pulpit committee is, Don? I said, yes, I'm familiar with the, with the idea. I know what one of those is, yes. And he goes, well, they want me to serve on one. I said, well, okay, that's, that's interesting, okay? And he said, um, the reason I had you come over is because surely there's got to be something in the Bible that says how we ought to pick a pastor. As like, as a matter of fact, and I took him to 1 Timothy chapter 3, <coughs> Titus chapter 1, and he very, you know, he just burned up a pencil writing all these things down and, and uh, some of the qualifications and different things. And he said, because we got our first meeting tonight and uh, I, I want to I just present some of this stuff. Because if we're looking for a pastor to teach us the Bible, we better make sure that we're getting the right pastor, don't you think? <laughs> and I said, yes, I, I really think that's a good idea. And he goes, um, we don't necessarily agree on that whole church thing, do we? And I said, what do you mean? And he said, well, you believe different than we do. And I was able to give him the gospel. And he made this statement. He said, well, he said, I thought everybody was going to heaven. There is some truth to that. Okay, now before you take me out as a heretic, okay, at the great white throne judgment, all those who are about to be cast into the lake of fire forever will stand before God in heaven. And I said, but whether you stay there or not is a completely different thing. And he said, well, I'd kind of like to stay. And I said, well, and I gave him the gospel. And he wasn't ready at that time. Now, whether he trusted Christ or not, I have no idea. Um, he, he, was, he was really not one to argue the points. Um, but when we come in contact with folks that believe what some of these groups believe, maybe they are Jehovah's Witnesses or Catholic or whatever, Church of Christ, I hope you don't look at it as, okay, it's, got, it's an argument to be won, okay? Just compassionately present the gospel. That's my goal. So we can become so familiar with what God's word says about what the gospel is. How do we get to heaven? Can we know that? Surely we can. We know that we can. 1 John 5 and verse 13 talks about the fact that you can know that you have eternal life. And they don't. Even though they've been baptized into a church of Christ, join the church of Christ, and do what the church of Christ says, they never have the assurance of their salvation up until the day they die. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to live my life that way. I don't want to live my life wondering whether or not I've done something, I've did something, said something, not good enough, not performed enough, that maybe, you know, my good works outweigh my bad works. And that's ultimately what the Church of Christ believes. It's a, it's a salvation by works. It's not by grace through faith in Christ alone. And we certainly need to pray for them. 
We need to understand our Bibles because if you have an opportunity, and I'm not going to I'm not going to send you out of here and say go track one down, okay? But if you have an opportunity to come in contact with somebody, maybe you know people that are, you know, friends or family or whomever, coworkers, whatever it might be. Maybe it's just you know while you're waiting in the um, the waiting room at a doctor's office or something like that, and you get in a conversation with them, and you find out that hey, oh, I don't believe that. I believe this. Okay, maybe you'll have some. Que- you'll you'll be able to kind of question, you know, what they believe, and and simply say, well, and and please, I, I would say this. As as much as I love you, and I trust as much as you love me. Please do not say, this is what my pastor says. <laughs> this is what our church believes. Okay? As, as wonderful as that is, okay? Present the truth of God's word. Because that is the truth. That's the truth. And, and just simply say, well, you know, God's word or the Bible says this. Any questions, comments, real quickly? I just wanted to say one thing that's real sad when, um, like Daryl Crawford, when he was alive, he told us that because um, he had gone to Church of Christ, mm-hmm. and because of his health, he was not able to get baptized. And right. they would tell him he was not saved. Right. And it wasn't until he got to meet you and you were able to tell him the real plan of salvation. Right. And he was really relieved because he physically said he could not get down into the right. baptism. Well, and, and the, the, not only that, that shut-ins, shut-ins have no way of getting to heaven. because it, even, even if they got baptized in the Church of Christ by a Church of Christ preacher, and then later in life their health deteriorated to the point where they couldn't come to church, guess what they've done? They've lost their salvation. So this is full immersion. Yes. So in, in a Church of Christ pre, uh, baptistry by a Church of Christ preacher. Okay, he is the he is the intercessor. He is the advocate, as far as that is concerned. Okay, any other questions, real quickly? Right. It's just like what what Teresa was saying. Right. 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 I understand what you're saying. If they're if they're they're putting their faith in Christ alone, and and like like Daryl, you know, he couldn't get he couldn't get baptized, and and I I went over I I don't know how much time I spent with him, but I and 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 I have a tendency to kind of belabor the point a little bit. Because I want to make sure that when, when I'm done, that they understand. Because I've had, you know, I've, I've led kids and adults to the Lord before, and you go down through the plan of salvation, and they pray their prayer, and, you know, sinner's prayer, whatever you want to call it, or, the, you know, you kind of help coach them through that. And then sometimes they'll walk out of there, and they won't really fully understand what they just did. So I like to ask, okay, if you died on your way to, you know, way home, after this, where would you go to? Would you go to heaven? Well, I think so. I hope so. Okay, and we go back over it. Okay, and 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 that we have to be willing to do that so they understand. Okay, I can know these things, and that's one of those things that it's it's a blessing to be able to see the the word of God used and the Holy Spirit of God use it for his honor and his glory and lead them to a saving knowledge of Christ. It's, it's a wonderful thing. Any questions, comments real quickly? All right, well, let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this opportunity that we've had. And, and we, we would pray, Lord, that you would help us just to have the kind of compassion that we should have. Uh, again, not just to, not to win an argument, <laughs> not to, to get one over on somebody or prove them wrong and ourselves right, but help us, Lord, just to present your word. 
help us to, to, to patiently, lovingly present the gospel to, to these that are in the Church of Christ or, or any other of the groups that we've looked at or even, even people that uh, they don't go to church because they don't believe in God. Whomever it might be, Lord, if they're lost, doesn't matter what they call themselves. If they do not have a relationship with Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, they've never put their trust, their faith, their reliance on what he did on the cross, plus nothing, to get them to heaven. We know from your word that they are lost. They are even still dead in their sin. And we know that you sent Christ into the world to save sinners. And we would pray that you would help us as your people to take the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ out into the highways and hedges, the lost world that we live in, and as the Apostle Paul mentioned, to compel people to be saved before it's eternally too late. There is going to come a time when time will be no more, and the church will be out of this world. And we pray, Lord, that between now and then, at the end of our lives, that you would help us to be faithful to your word, to pray for folks that we know that are lost, and to become so familiar with your word that we can, again, not just have a debate, not just have an argument, but we can present the clear, plain, simple gospel to them, praying that the Holy Spirit would open their eyes, that they might be saved. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have